welcome to the Mindful Healers podcast with Dr. Jesse Mahoney and Dr. Ni Cheng Lang. We are here to help you learn to pause and be present, awaken your breath, and harness the ripple effects of mindfulness for radiant health. We get you. We know you. We are you. We have both been successful on the surface, yet struggling underneath. We have both had cluttered brains, been overwhelmed, and exhausted. We're healers who have found solutions and want to share them with you. Join us here to discover a better way. Welcome. A reminder that our podcast should not be considered medical advice. The intention of today's episode is to share how mindfulness and coaching tools can help you traverse the journey of co-parenting, especially when you have differences in your parenting styles. Today, you'll discover that you and your co-parent are more than enough when it comes to successfully co-parenting your child or children. Takeaways from this episode are... As expected, that bringing mindfulness to the journey makes it better. And that when you honor your and your co-parents' authentic selves and what you both bring to parenting, the journey is much more rich and full and beautiful. I wanted to start with a quote, which I don't know who said it, but to me, it's very apropos for almost all relationship challenges which is what screws us up most in life is the picture in our head of how it is supposed to be. And this applies so well to the co-parenting issue because we all have ideas about how our parenting journey is supposed to be and how our children are supposed to behave and how our partners should parent because of potentially the way that we were raised and whether we want to parent like that or want to parent in reaction to that. But we have a vision of picture of how it is supposed to be. So letting go of that picture mindfully can be an incredible tool to enjoy the experience more. In true to form, the universe has provided us with an example of what we think our podcast is supposed to be, but what actually is happening. Do you want to comment about some of the background noise that our listeners might be hearing? Yes. So as at this moment, my neighbor's two lovely children are in the backyard squealing. I'm not sure exactly what they're doing. One is dancing in a um, skeleton suit, chasing bubbles. And the other is the older brother likely chasing him as noted by the squeals. So they are going to accompany us in this podcast discussing mindful co-parenting. And we may even get some live editions of um, the parents perhaps navigating the situation with different ideas about how it should be resolved. A moment to be mindful about what is and what's in our control and what's not in our control. So this topic is near and dear to my heart in part because as many of you know, I'm a pediatrician by training. And so I get asked about parenting and what's right and what's wrong in parenting all the time. I also am a mom of three boys, young men, and um, I do mindful coaching. And so being able to apply these tools of mindfulness and coaching to the parenting journey is really a game changer. And realizing that you can, with intention, show up for your parenting and co-parenting journey with peace and calm and groundedness and intention. And sometimes we think that we can't. Uh, It feels like maybe the stakes are too high or something bad will happen. But realizing that we always can, and when we do, it turns out much better than we expect. And so I wanted to offer in this episode that Even if your partner or co-parent, who may or may not still be a partner, isn't parenting like you think they should, there's still hope for peace and calm and groundedness along the way. But because many of us who have these very smart brains, and we all very much want the best for our children, we tend to have a lot of conflict around this topic. And for those of you that happen to be moms and maybe even pediatrician moms, I'm just gonna throw out there that we usually think we're right, that we're doctors and we know better and we know the right way to do it. And we may or may not know the right way. And in fact, there may or may not be a right way. 
and letting go of the way it's supposed to be or that there is a right way and just being present for the experience can be a really powerful shift for you and for your co-parent and for your children, for everyone along the journey. This idea of um, bringing up multiple right ways, quote unquote, is interesting because mindfulness can add to the ability for a parent to see different options as being right. So rather than thinking about one right way, mindfulness allows you to see multiple right ways. I love the idea of multiple right ways as opposed to a right way and a wrong way or a better way or a worse way. And so that there could be multiple right ways is a really eye-opening way to think about it. So we hope by doing this episode and releasing it on Father's Day, that it's just like our Mother's Day gift episode is a gift for Father's Day or co any co-parent of any kind to help bring more harmony into your relationships where you may or may not agree on how things should go. The first tip we wanted to share is of course, bringing mindfulness to the journey of co-parenting. And in my mind, it's bringing the ability to notice, to be aware, to be curious, non-judgment, accepting. And the other one that just popped into my head is also non-striving. I think as a parent, we're always striving and we think that we should all be striving towards the same thing. And taking the striving out of it can make the journey feel much more easeful. And then this idea of letting it go, or as John Kabat-Zinn says, letting it be, that that can be a really powerful way to ease some of these co-parenting struggles. And finally, showing up with intention and choosing how you want to show up for it, not the end goal you want, not the way your co-parent should parent, but how you want to show up for the experience and for whatever happens along the journey. So that was a lot packed into just a couple of sentences. And so we'll take some time to kind of break things down a little bit. Every time there's a disagreement or when you and your co-parent don't see eye to eye on something, there's an invitation for you to view that situation as an opportunity to practice mindfulness. And we have talked about multiple different acronyms for present moment mindfulness thought exercises. And I'm going to share again with you the shortest one. And that is the mindful bat practice. And it's apropos because it reminds us of the challenging year that we just had um, and the COVID bat as a potential origin. And so bat stands for B, breathe. So in the moment of difficulty, remembering to take a breath. A is for attend. So oftentimes we as parents and as healthcare professionals, we're attending to the needs of others, whether it be that of our children or a child or our co-parent or of our patients. Uh, there is a tendency to be attending to the needs of other people, perhaps for a lot more of the day then is allotted for ourselves. And so attend is a reminder for us to attend to ourselves, giving us a little bit of protected space to simply notice what's present for us from the standpoint of naming our emotions that we're feeling in the moment of difficulty, from the standpoint of noticing the body sensations that we're having, uh, and then also noticing the thoughts that are arising about the moment of difficulty. Then T is for after doing the exercise of attending to ourselves, T is then to transition into greater skillful action of response as opposed to a reaction that might be much more emotionally charged and yet very habitual for us that might not serve us, our co-parent, our child or children. Basically, it might not serve the situation if we resort to our 
ingrained patterns of behavior. Interesting. The bat reminds me of just this idea of pause and presence, right? Pause is the breathing. Pause, take a breath, stop, and then be present. That's your attend. And then that Victor Frankl quote we talk about all the time, between the stimulus and the response is where your power is. And so choosing how you want to respond as opposed to just reacting. And wouldn't it be great if we did that as a co-parent? And wouldn't it be great if our kids could watch us do that and learn how to do that themselves? Yeah, role modeling behavior, a moment of mindfulness. And I've actually timed this. The BAT acronym uh, mindful moment practice doesn't take more than 30 seconds, but it can be as long as you'd like it to be. I think it's, it's literally taking the time to think that you're going to pause rather than reacting. And if, once you make that stop, then you can pivot. So this honoring and allowing and accepting the difficult situation to be here just as it is, usually comes along with difficult emotions. Um, and the BAT acronym reminds us about noticing perhaps more skillful responses rather than resorting to habitual reactions in times of disagreement with our co-parent. I love the wording, more skillful reactions. (laughs) And this thought, in coaching, we often say accepting and allowing. And I just want to call out this accepting the difficult emotions, because we often resist them. We get to be disappointed, mad, and frustrated. And none of the mindful approaches and coaching does not say that you don't, that you have to like it or be happy about it. You should allow yourself to be frustrated, angry, disappointed, or sad, because resisting that just makes it worse. From there, those difficult feelings pass through you, and then you can choose a more skillful response. So speaking of response, difficult co-parenting situations is also another opportunity to practice mindful communication. I first learned about mindful communication when I did some teacher training intensive over at the University of Rochester Mindful Practice Programs with Ron Epstein and Nick Krasner. And the mindful communication exercise has been taught in medical schools uh, along with a different form of it called insight dialogue in the mindfulness-based stress reduction program. So I'd like to share a brief bit about how one can conduct a mindful communication exercise that might be particularly helpful when you're noticing a disagreement come about regarding co-parenting. So the question I pose for all of you is, what if you deeply listened to the other co-parent's perspective on the situation? And what if the co-parent, your co-parent, deeply listened to you regarding your own perspective about the situation? And so the instructions for this exercise, should you choose to experience it, is that the listener, which may or may not be you or your co-parent at that moment in time, does not interrupt, does not judge, doesn't advice give, and doesn't talk about oneself, especially when they're listening. At the end of listening, questions can be asked, but questions that only seek to clarify the situation or their perspective. And then you can reverse roles. So in this way, you might be able to hold space for each other in a different way than you usually do, and also provide an opportunity for you to hold space for yourself and also for the co-parent to hold space for you. The key piece of that exercise to me is the non-judgment. Because when you suspend the judgment, it creates that space that you were talking about, holding space for yourself. And we often 
judge others and our co-parents harshly because we judge ourselves so harshly. <laughs> and so that suspension of judgment can allow you to listen. What it doesn't mention, which I thought was interesting, is understanding. You just have to listen to it. Do you have to understand it or agree with it? So when you ask the clarifying questions, I think there is an underlying intention to try to understand and hence the clarification purposes of the questions. Because sometimes I wonder, sometimes we can't understand because we don't know where someone's coming from. And I've often come to this in relationship coaching that we don't have to understand. They get to be them and we get to be us. And I used to actually argue all the time that, well, I don't understand, I just want to understand. And I've come to realize that I, I don't always understand. I can accept and not like, and I cannot judge, and I can let it be mindfully, but that my understanding doesn't have to be a prerequisite for a, a solution. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think that holding space for someone else doesn't necessarily mean that you absolutely have to understand 100% of what they're saying or where they're coming from. Though holding space and deeply listening might allow you to have an increased opportunity to do so. So shifting gears to the intention piece and realizing that what's in our control is choosing how we show up for the experience and showing up with intention. And so last night, one of the things that came up in our conversation when we had a session in the Mindful Healthcare Collective about mindful coaching on co-parenting was um, someone mentioning how proud they were of how they had inadvertently handled co-parenting differences and that they had ended up in a space where they felt very proud and that they hadn't gone into it intending to feel that way, but that that was what they would recommend anyone who had challenges with a co-parent and maybe a really difficult parenting situation, particularly in the case of divorces or separation, that really asking your future self five years out, like what would they tell you to do? They would want you to be proud of how you had shown up. And that that is a really good um, intention to have is to decide that you wanna be proud of how you showed up as a mom and, or a dad and as a co-parent, and that you would want your children to be proud, if at all possible. And I thought that was a beautiful way to sort of open the discussion. And then the next thought is that you are a team, whether you're co-parenting together in the same house or in separate houses. And so what if you approached your co-parent as you would a teammate, offering them grace and compassion and allowing them to be the best teammate that they can be? And also allowing them to be imperfect. So when our teammate on a team doesn't do things the way we think they should, we don't usually get mad at them. And if we do, we don't usually get the results that we want. But when we support them and encourage them and offer to sort of optimize their ability to perform, that that's where the team does the best. So I loved that, that concept. The next... Um, piece of mindfulness that I think is super powerful is curiosity and recognizing that your co-parent may be really good at certain things that you're not good at. And there are things that you can watch and learn from them and that their way may be different than yours, but it might turn out even better. And then that if it doesn't turn out better, it may not matter. So one of the things I often bring up is if it's not um, CPS worthy, I like to say, or like child protective services worthy, everybody is safe and no harm is being done, then it's often very helpful to let your co-parent and the children work it out and figure it out. Because in that figuring out, everybody learns. So this idea that gifts can come in funny packages and it may look very different than you think but the learning in all of it may be tremendous. And whether it works out well or not, your kids are gonna learn. And then our brain tendencies are to immediately think that something terrible is gonna happen and to catastrophize how it might turn out and to have you know, negative worst case scenarios and what if something bad happens. So 
thinking about the fact that it might turn out better than you expect. And what if you let it be and just gave it a chance to turn out better than you expect or worse than you expect, but knowing that there's learning in all of it. As you mentioned curiosity, as a reminder, that's one of the foundations for mindfulness. The phrase that we've mentioned before, how interesting comes up and works really well in the situation when there's a difference in co-parenting. So how interesting that there is a potential disagreement on a particular situation and how it should be handled. And then asking yourself, why is that? Why is there a difference? And being curious about the existence and the origins of that difference can sometimes be really enlightening and worthy of like a very rich discussion. And the curiosity naturally creates a pause before you react because you're being curious and you're thinking about it. And so that can give you that time to take a deep breath and choose how you want to show up for it. Maybe you just want to show up curious, or maybe it leads you curiosity to more creative thinking and a different solution. So focusing on what's in your control in your co-parenting situation is a fantastic tool. And that's usually only you. Um, Our children are, as we know, not in our control and our co-parents are also not in our control. And so what you can control is how you show up for it. And I love this idea that of wanting your kids to watch you manage it well. And just like you may have differences with your co-parent, they will have differences with people in their life. And so watching you handle the differences and the different opinions is a lesson in and of itself. And handling it in a way that you are proud can be a really beautiful approach. Also, when you show up mindful and with less anxiety, because you've chosen to do so, there's less anxiety all around and your kids feel it, your co-parent feels it. And that creates space, not this intentional holding of space, but just space to breathe and space to come up with creative solutions. And then we've mentioned this quote before, but I feel like it's really helpful in these somewhat tense co-parenting situations. But when you stop struggling, you float. And so sometimes we're just resisting and struggling and letting it be can create that space and those calm seas and no longer sort of treading water and struggling to stay afloat and magical things can happen. And being able to do that and having your kids watch you do that can be a really valuable lesson for kids. A couple of other tools that I think are really valuable is humor and humor Um, around perhaps your differences of opinions or humor around the situation, not in an undermining way, but just to lighten the mood and kids tend to enjoy humor. And so whenever possible, bring humor into it. And then telling good stories. So we often tell ourselves stories about why something means something or why someone is doing a certain behavior or parenting in the way that they are and what might happen. And so why not tell yourself a good story and or tell no story at all and keep it simple and that that may lessen the drama and create more space to find creative solutions. So speaking of stories, we come to the role of parent and co-parent with our own childhood stories. And I think that I can speak for everyone in that our childhoods were not all just rainbows and butterflies. Absolutely, there were wonderful, joyful, happy moments. And yet there were probably also moments where there was difficulty and that's the norm. I wanted to bring up some examples specifically about when situations arise and you notice that there might be some parallels between what your child is experiencing and what you experienced in the past. Um, And bringing up the fact that your child's story of their childhood is different than that of your own childhood story, that 
that your child or children don't have to relive certain aspects of your own childhood. However tempting or hard it is to resist sometimes. Um, so I wanted to give some examples that I've noticed, particularly with my, my eldest daughter who instantly graduated fifth grade today. So she has been taking piano since age five or so, which is a blessing from my standpoint. And I also had the opportunity to learn piano from a very young age. But the way that I learned piano was very different and very intentionally um, different than how I wanted my eldest daughter to learn piano. From the respect of there was a lot more pressure and expectations and grasping per perfectionism, setting super high expectations of myself at a very young age to excel in playing piano and going to high stress competitions, for instance. Knowing that about my own childhood and knowing that I didn't want that experience to be mirrored by any of my children, I purposefully enrolled her in classes with the teacher that had the same goals in mind of not putting so much pressure on the child. And when there were recitals, the recitals were coming from a space of sharing, um, a space of achievement, of showing up just as you are, knowing that it's okay if you make a mistake during the recital, even if you had to start all over again. Uh, and so from that standpoint, you can change in some ways a part of the narrative from which you had experienced difficulty in childhood. So for me, this was an opportunity to reparent myself in that I didn't have to put all those expectations on myself or have such perfectionistic tendencies when I was playing piano and competing. Um, and as a result, really applying that wish and that goal and setting up the experience that I wanted for my eldest daughter to be one of fun rather than feeding into a perfectionistic anxiety provoking tendency. You know, what's interesting in your story also is that you wanted her to have a certain experience. And yet all that's in your control is showing up with the intention of having making piano fun. She may, on the other side, be one of the children who is a perfectionist or, you know, really wanting to perform at a high level and be very driven. And sometimes your children are the opposite of have the opposite experience of what you would want for them to have. And again, being mindful of the journey and that it may still turn out well. And just seeing what's in your control is your intention and what you've chosen to sign her up for. But her experience of it is going to be her own. And I think this is also where we get into trouble with our co-parents because we come to it with different ideas and you may have a certain intention for her piano experience and your partner may have a different intention for her piano experience. And yet, and her experience is gonna be an entirely different experience from either of your intentions. And I think realizing that it almost always turns out well and that we have so much less control than we think makes it a lot easier to detach from all of the fine details about which we may disagree or we may not have control. Because when we're trying to control the things that we can't, um, that's where we get anxious and frustrated within ourselves and also usually get more upset about what our co-parent is doing. One thing that's helped me and my co-parent has been to take ownership of a particular learning activity. So for me, it's setting up the piano experience for her. And for my husband, it's been really much more about 
her sport experience, like for volleyball, for instance. And so not being afraid to let go of some of the responsibility for setting up the learning and enrichment and having it be more delineated between you and your co-parent is I think also another way to parent from multiple dimensions and also not have to feel like you need to be all the roles for your child or your children. And that's actually the team approach we were talking about because your husband's good at, enjoys the, it cares about the sports and wants to have that role. And you perhaps care more about the uh, music experience. And I think that that's true in so many things in my family, you know, I do the education, medical stuff, um, girlfriend stuff, love stuff, relationship stuff. And my husband um, does my kids are older now, but the legal stuff, the insurance stuff, he helps them with jury duty and the leases. And um, for him, it was sports because they're boys and they play baseball and he knows baseball and I don't. Like, I'm happy to show up and help with the snack bar, but that's about it. Um, And so that we can allow ourselves to each shine in whatever area that we do. And that that actually brings more wealth of experience and more richness to our children's lives, learning from one another. So as usual, we wanted to end with a few reflection questions. And mindful coaching actually offers strategies of what we call asking good questions or asking empowering questions or asking useful questions, whichever word appeals to you and feels comfortable. And that Also, these questions very much come from a place of abundance rather than scarcity mindset. And I think in parenting, a lot of our conflict comes from the idea of a scarcity of good outcomes and a scarcity of success and a scarcity of things turning out well. And so asking yourself questions that train your brain to see the abundance and see what's going well and see how you're better together can really enhance the co-parenting experience and enhance your children's childhood experience. So asking questions, how is your co-parent doing a good job? We notice exactly how they're doing a not good job, but how do they do a good job? What do they offer to your children that you can't or don't or don't want to? How are they value added? What can you as a parent learn from them? And if you have two very different parenting styles, what if that's better for your children? What if it leads to growth and strength and flexibility? And often many single parents wish that they had a co-parent and the co-parents wish that their other co-parent did it the way they wanted and that they could just do it their way. And so just accepting and allowing whatever you've got and enjoying it and noticing how whatever you have might be of real value. I always like to ask the very useful, helpful question of what would love do when you're in a disagreement about parenting and what would love do for you? What would love do for your co-parent and what would love do for the child as all being important? And potentially what would peace do if that is a desired feeling. And then how can you show up so you will be proud of how you showed up years from now? Reminding you that showing up authentically as you and showing up with your love for your child or children is more than enough. And remembering that you and your co-parent both almost always love your children tremendously and want the best for them. And so you are alike in that. You just have a different vision of how to get there and what it should look like. I wanted to end with one final concept that has come up a few times in relationships over the last few months. And I've heard from people who listen to the podcast that they really enjoyed when we brought this up in the past, which is the idea of seasons in relationships. And it came up in our podcast, both about love and in our podcast about mothers and realizing that our relationships with important people in our lives are almost always quite long. And that in the moment, we get very focused on what's happening in the moment. 
But if you think about our, most of our relationships are many, 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 many years, and it's a journey. And so you might be really good at a certain part of your children's journey, and your partner may be really good at another part. Or you may make an exceptional grandmother. My mother-in-law used to say that I'm the world's best grandmother, but the parenting part wasn't her favorite part. So we all have different opportunities in different seasons and periods where we are very close with a child and not as close. Or in the teenage years, maybe there's a time where you have conflict or one style of parenting works better than the other. And so allowing that we are human and we are all imperfect and that it's a long journey and that there are seasons. And so if this season isn't the best looking season or the most enjoyable season, that there will be another season and trusting that it will all work out in the end. If you enjoy listening to our podcast, please share, follow us, leave us stars and reviews. We especially love reading reviews from our listeners. Please stay on for our mindful moment after the sound of the bell. So with that, I once again want to thank Dr. Ann Kennard for joining us on the Mindful Healers podcast today. What a special opportunity, not only to hear about nourishment, but to be nourished by her backyard wind chimes. And if you're watching on YouTube, her beautiful lemon tree and just her beautiful healing, nourishing presence, all as it is. So thank you so much. And if you enjoyed listening to this episode, we would be most grateful if you would leave us some written reviews and stars to help other people find it. And we would love to share with you a beautiful, nourishing, mindful moment with Dr. Ann Kennard following the sound of the singing bowl. Thanks so much. And we'll see you next week. As always, If you want to declutter your mind, be more present, and start truly living your one wild and precious life, come find us at the mindfulhealerspodcast.com. Work with one of us. Work with both of us. Start or up-level your mindfulness practice. Discover how mindful coaching can change your life. Or even better, do both as part of our Mindful Healers programs and retreats. You can find links to find out more about our programs and join our communities at themindfulhealerspodcast.com. Reach out and get started on your journey to a life better lived today. The content of this podcast is not meant to be medical or life advice. If you choose to participate in our mindful moments, please do so safely. Welcome to the mindful moment. If it's safe to do so, I invite you to close your eyes or lower your gaze a few inches in front of you. Inviting you to place your hands atop your heart, applying a gentle but firm pressure, giving yourself a little oxydocin boost. Inviting you to bring to your mind's eye an image or the felt presence of your child or children. And wishing your child or children these loving and kind intentions. May you be well, may you find peace, May you be happy. May you be free from harm. May you be well. May you find peace. May you be happy. May you be free from harm. May you be well. May you find peace. May you be happy. May you be free from harm. Sending some gratitude for your child or children and letting them drift back into the background. Now bringing in your mind's eye, 
an image or the felt presence of your co-parent. And wishing them those same loving and kind intentions. May you be well. May you find peace. May you be happy. May you be free from harm. May you be well. May you find peace. May you be happy. May you be free from harm. May you be well. May you find peace. May you be happy. May you be free from harm. And sending gratitude to your co-parent, letting them drift into the background. And bringing an image of yourself into the forefront of your attention. And wishing yourself those same good intentions. May I be well. May I find peace. May I be happy. May I be free from harm. May I be well. May I find peace. May I be happy. May I be free from harm. May I be well. May I find peace. May I be happy. May I be free from harm. Sending gratitude for yourself, for being just as you are, and now bringing to your mind's eye or sensing the felt presence of your child or children and your co-parent along with yourself, you as a family unit, and sending loving and kind intentions. May we be well. May we find peace. May we be happy. May we be free from harm. May we be well. May we find peace. May we be happy. May we be free from harm. May we be well. May we find peace. May we be happy. May we be free from harm. Sending gratitude for this unit, this interconnectedness of a family. Going even deeper within and checking in, noticing what's here for you now after that brief loving kindness practice. what body sensations you're noticing, what emotions you're noticing, perhaps noticing any thoughts that you might have about the practice that you just participated in. And as you're ready, letting your hands come back into your lap, blinking open eyes, Letting the light back in. Thanks for practicing with us. <laughs>